So this is the first set of uh, in the series of lectures that we have. Uh, so the first lecture will be pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Google K. Verma. Uh, Professor Verma has done his uh, MSc in mathematics from Richpilan in 51 and PhD from Purdue University. And he was a postdoctor in the Royal Institute of Sciences. He has been in the IIT Bombay since 1990 and he was head of the department from 2006-2009 and Dean of Faculty Affairs from 2014-2016. Professor Verma has played a key role in the establishment of National Center of Mathematics in 2011, which is a joint center of PIFR and IIT Bombay. He has been its secretary and member of its ethics committee since 2011. In recognition of his research contribution, Professor Verma has been was elected as Fellow of National Academy of Sciences, Alaba, in 2008, and Fellow of Indian, Academy, Indian National Academy of Science Academy in 2012. He is also Fellow of International Center of Theoretical Physics. Uh, he was he also a Fellow of International Center of Theoretical Physics in 2012. He is recipient of IIT Bombay's uh, Excellency Teaching Award Mathematics in 2016. Professor Verma has published uh, over 45 research uh, publications in international journals and he has co authored a textbook, Formulary Topology and Algebra, and co edited three proceedings of conferences. He is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Pure and Applied Mathematics, lecture of series in Ramanujan Mathematical Society and Bolivino Mathematics Teacher Association. Professor Verma uh, has been involved uh, in teaching our undergraduates, postgraduates, PhD students over so many years and he will share his experience. Thank you, Professor Patwardhan. Uh, it's, it's a unique experience for me to talk about teaching. Uh, it's like asking a swimmer to tell how he swims and uh, he becomes so uh, accustomed to swimming that he forgets how he swims. This is exactly like what a teacher does. Uh, we have been teaching for many, many years, but we rarely reflect on what we exactly we are doing. And especially a teacher in uh, IITs or uh, other institutes, they are asked to teach when they have not been trained in teaching. We, we receive no training in teaching, but we start teaching. Okay, I wish there was some kind of induction program which uh, this center or you, you are going through for all the IIT teachers because we learn from our uh, seniors and uh, learn from experience and so it's, it's a slow, it's a art that we acquire slowly. But over a period of time, of course, when we uh, listen to good speakers and see their successful practices, we uh, try to adapt them. And this is the, this is the, uh, way in which I have prepared my lecture. So uh, I've been involved uh, teaching at many levels, starting from undergraduates to uh, PhD level. And the approach at each level has to be different because the audience are different. If I'm talking to teachers, then the approach has to be different in teaching. If I'm talking to a high school graduate, the approach has to be different. So, uh, but we are involved in uh, courses of different types and therefore we have to adapt our style of teaching also depending on who the audience is and what the level of the course is. The, uh, so what I'm going to describe today uh, is not about advanced courses but it is about the, my experiences in teaching undergraduate classes. So uh, all the engineers must learn uh, about four math courses uh, in four semesters. Uh, some of these are optional and some of them are compulsory, uh, but the classes tend to be very large. So the, our first course in mathematics that every engineer, engineering student has to do uh, is calculus. And in that course, we have 1100 students coming every semester. And, and it's, it's very difficult to have small classes. So our classes are large, but then they are split into tutorial batches of uh, say 40 or 50 students where interaction is possible. Uh, 
So in a big class, it is a challenge to be interactive and say challenge to uh, uh, adapt, uh, adopt the active learning approach, but it can be done. Okay, if one tries, it can be done. It may not be possible in every class, but occasionally it is possible. Okay, so the points that I'm going to uh, explain here, uh, they are based on uh, what I have learned from my senior teachers because we are always working in a team. A class of 1100 students is taught by a team of four or five instructors and there are senior instructors and there are junior instructors and so we learn from uh, what they have been teaching or how, what good practices they have adopted. We learn from them. The, then we constantly read the literature about teaching uh, so that we try to adapt uh, the new practices that are coming up, okay. Uh, also, there are excellent newsletters now about teaching and learning. Uh, for example, there is a center in Stanford called the Center for uh, Teaching and Learning and that sends out a newsletter uh, every month and it has excellent uh, articles and uh, it points out resources, uh, what research is being done so that teaching improves and how we can make our courses a better learning experience. So I, I request you to subscribe to that newsletter. You can go to the Stanford site and uh, see the Center for Teaching and Learning and there is an option to subscribe to their newsletter. It's, uh, it gives really, uh, uh, it's a good resource for teachers to, uh, be, to be up to date about the latest methods or research which is being done in teaching and learning. Okay, so, so what I'm going to tell you is uh, personal experiences uh, and, and uh, I'm not saying that you can adopt them because the, the classes for which I'm talking about are large classes, okay? They have 300 students in a class and there is a certain uh, uh, way in which we, uh, certain material that we have to uh, cover during the whole semester of 40 lectures and, but we, we try to uh, adapt some of the techniques of active learning during our lectures and tutorials, okay. So, uh, let me, let me begin. Yeah. All right, so here is the outline. So, uh, through this lecture, I want to sort of sensitize you to some important issues about design and teaching uh, undergraduate math classes. These are, this is not about uh, MSc classes or PhD classes, okay. It is only about undergraduate math classes. Okay, uh, so the basic philosophy of math courses for scientists and engineers has to be different from the philosophy that we adopt for mathematics students. Okay, when a mathematics student is being taught, we have in mind that he will become a mathematician, okay, mostly, uh, or become a teacher, uh, but a scientist and engineer has to use the mathematics that we are transmitting or informing. So there's a clear difference between the objective uh, for, for a science and engineering student who is learning mathematics and a mathematics student who is learning mathematics. The approach has to be different in, because the audience and the uses are different for that uh, knowledge that we are imparting. Uh, okay, this, this, is, this is probably valid for all lectures, whether these are English literature lectures or math lectures or physics lectures. Uh, I'll talk about these things. Uh, blackboard technique. Uh, of course, we have slides and uh, MOOCs and uh, many, many uh, devices to give lectures, but for mathematics and for uh, explaining traditional parts of mathematics, Blackboard seems to be the best. It is not uh, some personal philosophy that I'm imparting. It is learned by continuous feedback which we receive from students every year for last three decades. We, we switch to uh, teaching on slides uh, about 20 years ago because the class is large, but every year the students demand that please teach on Blackboard. Okay, so uh, we, uh, so I'll talk about Blackboard techniques. So I'm assuming that the class, the, the, uh, the class that I'm talking about is delivered on Blackboard, not on slides. Okay, because for mathematics, Slides are the worst way of teaching as far as the students are concerned. For a teacher, it may be easy to lecture on slides. He knows the material, but 
student needs to grasp material and uh, slides come in the way of grasping. Okay. There is some essential preparation we have to uh, do before the class and take care of some points during the class and of course after the class we should also contemplate about what we did in the class. Okay. So this is exercise in self-improvement and I will talk about that. Uh, weekly assignments, okay. a course must have weekly assignments otherwise students are not going to learn. Uh, office hours for interaction with students and I will talk about uh, the, my experiences uh, or experiences of many faculty members at IIT Bombay about how we conduct examination, how we set up the examination. So this is not about setting up the JE paper which is tends to be very, very difficult. But uh, if we want to encourage learning among students, the, the question paper has to be designed with lot of thought, okay. Otherwise the students are going to lose faith in what we have taught them, okay. Uh, so I will talk about towards the end, uh, alright. So basic philosophy for mathematics courses for engineers and scientists, okay, not for mathematicians, okay. It will be completely different if I talk about teaching mathematics students, but these are students of science and engineering who are uh, primarily there to learn techniques which they can use in their research or uh, in engineering applications. Okay, so it is the basic philosophy. So this is uh, very, uh, very nicely put in a textbook uh, on calculus which are produced in 94 by a consortium based at Harvard University. Uh, so it mentions four basic principles and uh, we have been using these four principles but this is the first time I am articulating these principles here. Okay, so these are the, so this is the rule of three. Every topic should be presented geometrically numerically and algebraically, okay. This is especially true for uh, mathematical techniques that an engineer and scientist is going to learn. He has to learn from many perspectives because we don't know which perspective is going to be useful when he tries to solve a practical problem which arises in industrial applications or scientific applications. So there have to be many angles of understanding and this is captured by this rule of three that if there is a geometry behind the topic, explain the geometry. There is a numerical analysis of, uh, so uh, take, take for example the, uh, the uh, planetary motion, right. So Kepler's laws tell us that the planets are moving in elliptic orbits, but sometime a physicist has to actually uh, get its uh, hand dirty in dealing with the actual data about planetary motion. What is the, what, 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 what is the actual orbit, how it is calculated, how this data is collected and how to determine the reappearance or how to predict uh, the, um, the length of the year of each planet. So you have to deal with actual data and that is done by numerical techniques and the students must learn to uh, uh, you know, deal with the data, okay. Then algebraically, okay, every, Every mathematical technique has certain part of algebraic manipulations and sometimes we have to uh, use methods of linear algebra and abstract algebra to do these applications. So the algebraic aspects have to be conveyed properly. Then the fourth principle which is very important for engineering and science students is the way of Archimedes. So Archimedes is from, uh, from uh, he is a mathematician, physicist, inventor, engineer from uh, antiquity. And he practiced this method and we still practice it uh, and it, it is use, very, very useful in, uh, in uh, dealing with engineering problems. Formal definitions and procedures evolve from investigation of practical problems. So in, in a typical math class, uh, suppose I am teaching uh, differentiation, yeah. So it is, it is not going to be good. Uh, if you simply define what is derivative of a function and then calculate some examples. Students will be perplexed, they will not know what is the purpose. You must point out what the applications are. So unless you explain them first, they start with the problem of 
Suppose you are given trajectory of a particle moving in space and we want to determine the uh, velocity vector. This is the practical problem, okay. For, for shooting satellites, you have to determine what, what the trajectory of the satellite is going to be, what is the velocity at each point, okay. So in order to solve that problem, you have to pose that problem first, the practical problem, and then slowly uh, explain how the mathematical concept of derivative arises and it actually solves the problem. Then there is a motivation for learning. Rather than bombarding the students with all kinds of mathematical theorems, definitions, and then not doing any applications. Okay, so a math course for engineering students has to have large number of applications to science and various branches of engineering. Then they will appreciate the power of mathematical techniques. Okay, so this is the way of Archimedes that formal definitions and procedures, uh, that is algorithms, evolve from investigation of a practical problem. Okay, there is a, always, there is a, there should be a problem should be presented before you teach any piece of mathematics. It could be a problem in geometry, like how to find tangent line to a curve at a point. Okay, because the tangential direction represents many physical quantities like any vector quantity, acceleration or velocity. One could pose the problem geometry and solve that. So this is the way of Archimedes. So rule of three, that uh, geometrically, numerically, and algebraically you present the problems, and and these the mathematics should should be taught because there is a need, practical need to solve certain problem. Okay. All right. So and one should use one 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 can use these four principles to design each and every lecture. So you might say that. All right, these are good for science and engineering, but where are the books which are written in this way? If you look around, there are many books which follow these principles. So I, I'll, I have just selected a few of these. Uh, for example, this is a, uh, a book on linear algebra. Every, every engineering student learns some linear algebra. This is a book by uh, Gilbert Strang. He is a professor at MIT. All his lectures which are based on this book are available on YouTube or um, MIT open uh, OCW site. Uh, then uh, he has written, then this book about, uh, uh, book about calculus which the consortium at Harvard University wrote. These, these authors are, there's a team of, a team of uh, writers, about 10 professors got together and wrote this book on calculus, uh, which is now in I think 10th edition. And it follows these four basic principles in teaching calculus. Uh, this is another book by Marston and Tromba and Weinstein. This is on multivariable calculus and uh, it combines mathematics, multivariable, the basic things about multivariable calculus uh, and, and uh, many principles in fluid mechanics, electromagnetic theory uh, simultaneously in every topic. So if you teach multivariable calculus, where coupled with applications to fluid mechanics and uh, electrical engineering, the students will get convinced why these concepts have to be learned. Should not be, cannot be taught in isolation. This is a classic. Uh, this is by Richard Courant and uh, Fritz John, Introduction to Calculus and Analysis, which is full of applications to uh, engineering and, uh, and physics. Okay, lots of, much of, most, most of the calculus textbooks, they are copied from the way this book uh, organizes the material. Richard Courant and uh, this, so there are two volumes and I, I, uh, I think every calculus teacher uh, should read, if you are presenting a topic to your class, read first from this book. Because most calculus books follow the development that this book started first. Okay, so read the masters. Uh, your textbook may be uh, prescribed by any, any author, but a teacher should learn the material from masterly expositions. So, uh, and in every area, there are some books, there are some books written by masters and one should be aware of those books and we, we learn a lot by reading those. Okay, so uh, here are some applications. So, for example, in, in, uh, if you are teaching a course in calculus, uh, the Archimedes method to find area of a parabolic segment. So we, we do this 
uh, we find areas uh, which are bounded by certain curves in every uh, course in calculus, in one variable calculus. Uh, but, uh, and this is done after developing lots of theory about differentiation and integration, and then finally you start solving the problem about area bounded by a parabolic arc, or what is the area uh, bounded by a circle. But uh, if, if you read the Archimedes method, it is so intuitive uh, that one get convinced why this method is working. And the, if you present Archimedes proof, you will see that the seeds of the theory of integration are hidden in his solution for finding the area of parabolic segment. So some classical mathematics could be presented when you are presenting certain topic. So uh, for example, Kepler's law about for the orbits and velocity of the planets. So Kepler found them um, by empirically based on the data that Tycho Bay had collected over m many, many years. But uh, using Newton's law of uh, gravitation and uh, his laws of motion, uh, Kepler's law can be derived by very simple applications of uh, derivatives and uh, basic uh, things in calculus. So uh, I would suggest that whenever you teach calculus, mention these Kepler's laws. And there are three Kepler's laws. One of them, at least, you can derive in class. That shows the effectiveness of methods of calculus. Okay, Newton explained these things. He did not use calculus. If you read Newton's book called Principia Mathematica, he did not use calculus uh, to, uh, to, to calculate the orbits of planets because he himself invented calculus and it was not an accepted branch of mathematics at that time. He had to explain things by Euclidean geometry, which, is, which was the established method of proof in mathematics. But later on, of course, Lagrange and Bernoulli, and uh, they, they redid whatever Newton did using methods of calculus. And Kepler's laws is, is a beautiful example to explain to students, uh, to show how effective basic methods of calculus are to predict uh, the orbits of planets and uh, actually derive uh, uh, many things. Okay. Then here is another example. Uh, Gauss predicted the reappearance of, uh, uh, of, of the asteroid, asteroid uh, series uh, using his method of least squares. I'll explain a little bit about this method. Uh, and in multivariable calculus, we, we introduce divergence, curl, and gradient in fluid flow and uh, electromagnetic fields. I think there will be a lecture by Professor Kulkarni on, on, on this topic. Uh, so if, if you are teaching divergence curl and uh, Green's theorem and Gauss theorem and Stokes theorem, uh, they can be taught with no reference to applications. They make perfect sense. Okay. Gradient, uh, gradient and divergence, they make perfect sense. You may not refer to anything and still prove the Stokes theorem. But in a course on multivariable calculus, uh, if you explain the links with fluid mechanics or EM theory, then your students of engineering, many of them are doing electrical engineering, some of them are doing mechanics or chemical engineering, they will understand the utility of these concepts uh, for, for their own use. Okay. So, so therefore, uh, one, one can incorporate these things in your course and explain. Uh, and I usually, when I teach a course on multivariable calculus, I end the course with Maxwell's equations. Okay, there are uh, four, four Maxwell's equations, and uh, these equations combine all the operators that we teach in multivariable calculus, gradient, divergence, and the, but then one solves these Maxwell equations. Okay. And the solutions indicate that there are electromagnetic waves, and before Maxwell's equation, Nobody had any idea that there are radio waves and you can use them for transmission. So this is a perfect ending for any course on multivariable calculus. The students will get convinced that of course you do some mathematics, but the, the solutions indicate that radio waves exist. And once you tell a physicist that radio wave exist, he will somehow concoct an experimental device to actually detect them. And all the modern transmission happened because these equations were written down by Maxwell and people solved them. Okay, so, uh, so then the students do get excited that uh, the, the, whatever the teacher is teaching in multivariable calculus has led to so many modern developments and therefore it is 
uh, it is essential to learn these techniques. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to linear algebra, of course, there are many applications. And uh, if you read book by Strang, uh, in every chapter he ends with some application. Okay. Uh, so, for example, using diagonal symmetric matrices, we can recognize the shape of quadric surfaces and conic sections uh, using eigenvalues. We can use eigenvalues in Google search. When you are searching something in Google, there are eigenvalues involved behind the scene. Some algorithms about matrices are working and some eigenvalues are being approximated. And then due to this page rank algorithm, you get results where the most important results are displayed first. And then uh, later on, the results that are displayed may not be of much of use. So, so the students, if they can be explained how eigenvalues are used in Google search, they will get convinced that this is not some ancient mathematics. It is being used every day. Using incident matrices of graphs to predict features of graphs. So graph algorithms are widespread and a lot of computer science algorithms are based on graph theory. And uh, the, the methods of eigenvalues of incident matrices are very useful to study graphs. Eigenvalues are also used in maximum minimum problems of multivariable function. Linear programming is basically a marriage of calculus and linear algebra. Okay. So in a course on linear algebra, if you can give little bit indication about how linear programming problems can be solved using eigenvalues and uh, matrix algorithms, students will get convinced that they must learn this subject very well. Okay. So I could make such a list for other courses like differential equations or complex analysis or numerical analysis. The point get, that I'm getting across is that in, a, in any course in, uh, or that you teach in mathematics, point out, spend some time in pointing out applications. And Strang does it in every chapter. I would say in every module that is prescribed for you to teach, you can bring in some applications, real life applications, so that students get convinced about the utility of learning those mathematical concepts. For example, use of splines in image processing. These are cubic curves and they are enough to do image processing uh, for many, many purposes. So let me explain a little bit about the least square method. Uh, how uh, we, we could, this, this, I, this is a randomly selected topic and uh, you could do this for other topics in your uh, math classes. And the, right, so uh, when you present a math, mathematics topic, uh, there, it has some historical roots. And it's a good idea to learn about how certain techniques wa was invented, what was the need and what was the application that the inventor had in mind, okay. So, and this could be told to the students that uh, this is not something uh, that came out of uh, nowhere, but there was a practical need and uh, that, that need gave rise to these techniques and these techniques are then uh, polished or they are improved by generations of mathematicians. So this is true for this method of least squares. So in 1801, a very famous mathematician called Gauss, called Frederick Gauss, he computed the orbit of newly discovered asteroid uh, series using only three observations. So on 1st January uh, 1801, an astronomer, an Australian astronomer, uh, the, he, he observed this asteroid. It was almost 1,000 kilometers across. And he thought it's a new planet. Nobody had thought, uh, seen this before. But the way it was moving, uh, he soon realized that it's not a planet and he observed it three more times. So over a period of about one and a half month, he made three observations. What, uh, three observations was the date and the time on which he observed the, the asteroid and what was the position in the sky of the asteroid. That, and, and then he announced, he published a paper that he has uh, probably discovered a new planet and here are the three observations. Okay. So this, this happened in January and February and then people came to know about this new planet and Gauss was only 24 years old at that time. And he took this challenge on him that if, if it is a planet, okay, it is going to be seen once again. So after February, this was not visible. Okay. So he was convinced that if it is a planet, it will be seen again. And 
he took on himself to find the, to predict the time when it will be seen again. So it's like predicting eclipses, solar eclipses or this. So in order to do that, he had to calculate the orbit based on three observations. And of course, in his time, it, Kepler's laws were known. The, uh, the orbit has to be elliptic, but uh, every, every uh, orbit of a planet lies in a different plane than the plane in which the Earth is moving. Every planet has its own plane of rotation. So he had to calculate uh, the precise orbit and then predict when it is going to reappear. Gauss did that and in doing so, he invented this method of least squares. That you have few observations and you want to find the, the, uh, the curve which will be, which will, in which the data is going to fit. We do that now, nowadays all the time, okay? Lots of data is being generated, but then we have to derive certain conclusions from this data, and that's, uh, so one of the techniques for, uh, for uh, this is the curve fitting, okay? Which curve will fit your data, or which, on which surface your data is lying, okay? Then the new techniques, uh, we, instead of fitting a curve, we try to fit a surface, because that's, that's the natural place on which your data is fitting. Okay. So Gauss thought about uh, fitting an ellip ellipse okay, so that those three observations will be uh, according to the orbit which is specified by this ellipse. So he invented this method of least squares. Let me just explain briefly. Uh, there's a, uh, it is not possible for me in this uh, short time to explain the physics behind how he came up with this. Uh, so I'll only explain the, the mathematical problem which he confronted uh, after doing all the uh, uh, physical analysis of this, okay. So the asteroid is moving in its orbit and the Earth is moving in its orbit. So he had to deal with two coordinate systems and find the plane, the inclination of these two planes, find the uh, velocity and uh, then find the uh, eccentricity of the ellipse and the many things that he had to do. Okay, nowadays these are becoming routine for any course on astronomy, the, the methods that he invented. Yeah, so let me explain this, yeah. So we try to fit uh, a polynomial, a curve given by a polynomial of degree m. So sometimes we fit a straight line to a data. Many times the data fit on a straight line, then the, the polynomial is degree one. So we will stop at s0 plus s1 x. Sometimes we need, the, the data will be lying on a parabola or an ellipse, like in the case of asteroid. The, the three observation will be lying on a elliptic orbit, okay? So think of a fitting a general uh, curve given by a polynomial equation of degree m when we know the certain data points, x i, y i. So value of x is known and the, the, y, the value of y is known at this value of x. And we want to uh, fit this polynomial and of course there is an experimental error always all these data may not accurately fit in the curve which is described by y equal to uh, this polynomial, okay? So what do, what do people do? They try to fit a, a curve so that the error is minimized. So the curve will predict certain value of y coordinate if the input is x coordinate. So that value may not be the, the observed value, okay? But we will find that curve uh, so that the, the error is minimized. That is error between the predicted value and the actual value of the y coordinate. So, so that, that error, so first, first we have to, we have to uh, uh, set up this problem. This problem of finding S0, S1, S2, Sm. So we are trying to find a polynomial approximation to this data of degree m. So these are the unknowns, S0, S1, S2, Sm, these are the unknowns and uh, so if you substitute value of xi here, uh, the value of yi will come from this equation and these n equations can be written in matrix form uh, as ax equal to b where a is this matrix and b is the output, the y coordinates and x are these x, x vector consist of these unknown coefficients of this polynomial that we are going to fit. So if you multiply a with x, you will see that it is, uh, it is 1 times as 0 x1 times s1, etc. So you will get the first observation, second observation, there are n observations. These n observations can be fitted into this matrix equation ax equal to b. But 
uh, the, the coefficients size that we are trying to find, uh, they should be such that the error is minimized. How do we measure the error? Okay. So the most favorite method of measuring the error is in terms of squares. Yeah. So, so suppose we want to fit a straight line instead of a quadratic or a cubic polynomial. We want to fit a straight line to the data. Then you look at yi minus s minus xi t. This is the this is the answer given by the straight line, and this is the actual answer which we have calculated through experiment. You take the difference of the predicted answer from the straight line and the observed value square, and then sum up these uh, differences and take the square root. Okay, so this is. So we want to minimize this quantity. All these errors are adding up and we want to minimize the error. So here is a function of two variables and we want to minimize, we want to minimize this. So what do we do? Take the partial derivative with respect to S and T, both partial derivatives should vanish, okay? And when we do that, okay, I will not reveal all the calculations, but if you set up the two partial derivatives and you have those end data fitting the straight line, what you get are what are called normal equations of that uh, that, that matrix that I wrote down. So A transpose AX equal to A transpose B, okay? So X and B are as in the previous slide and uh, so, so we, we want to solve this and one can then analyze that this always has a solution, okay? So you find the solution and then, uh, so that's, that's how, uh, but this is not the only way to present the least square method. This is the least square method. Uh, so Gauss wanted to fit a degree two equation because elliptic orbit is described by a degree two equation. And degree two equation will lead, will lead to the similar, same kind of normal equations. A transpose A x equal to uh, A, A transpose times B and then one can solve using linear algebraic techniques. Uh, apply and then Gauss invented this Gauss elimination method to solve system of linear equations. So that's, that's why he did this. This is the root cause of Gauss elimination method that he has, he came out in the, in, the, in his effort to minimize the errors. Uh, he came out with this, this system of linear equations and then he invented his Gauss elimination method to solve this linear system of equations, okay? So these things are, we teach in linear algebra, but rarely people point out the root, the, where, how these techniques came about in the first place. So there, is a, there was a physical problem which was guiding uh, the invention of these techniques and therefore if you explain this to the students, the course will become interesting, okay. Yeah, all right. So uh, we, we were uh, <coughs> talking about uh, active learning, uh, uh, in a, but in a, in a mathematics course where you have to explain a proof uh, to, a, to a high school graduate it is not possible to get response. It's not possible to get response. Of course, if you give a problem which is based on that concept, you can expect some answer. But when it comes to, say, say for example, the method of least squares, I don't think any, anybody can guess what is this method of least squares. In the class, of course, there may be some smart student who will be given enough hints, will come up with this method after some thought, but to instantly get answers about uh, complicated, involved mathematical concepts is difficult. But you can do, you can practice active, active learning through another mode for in any mathematics course. I'll describe that in a few minutes, okay? So the principal mode of, what I'm trying to say is that principal mode of uh, transmitting knowledge about mathematical techniques is a lecture. This has not changed for hundreds of years. So we take a concept and through our experience, we try to explain what this concept is, work out some examples, motivate historically, give some applications, yeah. So this is the, this is the method which has been uh, uh, in existence and I still believe that uh, giving a lecture about a mathematical concept is probably the best way to introduce students to mathematical concepts, okay. You can incorporate active learning through other means, okay? Yeah. So slides and videos and MOOCs, they are very recent techniques and they have their place, but the, the principal way in which mathematics is imparted is on Blackboard. 
and it is the traditional way of teaching. Okay, this has not changed. Yeah. So uh, Blackboard is far better. The, the, if, if you put material on, on slide, uh, we are restricted in displaying very limited amount of mathematics. Okay, here also we have only two blackboards, but we have some other lecture hall complexes where now we have six blackboards. In mathematics departments, in some rooms, we have eight blackboards. Okay, the point is uh, when we are presenting a mathematical concept and a proof and illustrative example, the entire material has to be present at a time. It should not disappear from the view. This is not possible on one slide or two slides, okay. So the entire material has to be on display so that you go back and forth to refer to it. Student may have certain doubt in a difficult part of the proof, then how does he point out where his doubt was? If the material has disappeared, slides disappear in five minutes. Then you are on a new slide and the, the student is at a loss to point out exactly where his doubt is. So that is why uh, using multiple blackboards to present your material is I think still the best way to present mathematics. Yeah, so very useful to have many blackboards for teaching math courses so that much of the material remains visible for referring to the previous steps or summarizing main steps in the proof. Okay, we have to, when we present a long proof, the students get lost and we have to, you know, catch their attention back and we can do that by summarizing the proof and going back to where we started with, okay, and look at the main points of a proof. All right, so this is about the lecturing style, uh, in what way mathematics uh, is presented and it is still uh, if, you, if you look at the lectures of uh, Gilbert Strang on uh, YouTube, he is using maybe eight blackboards. He is hardly erasing anything during the lecture. The entire material is on there on the blackboard, okay. And it's a large class, class with 400 students. And he is still using blackboard to explain mathematics. All right, so well before a course starts. So this is about uh, my experience or many people's experience about how uh, when you are assigned a course, uh, what steps you have to take. So many times you are assigned a new course which you have probably forgotten, yeah? So then you have to prepare very well before the course begins. It requires much, a lot of time, okay? So well before a course starts, yeah? So delivery of good lectures is an art and it requires thorough preparation, constant effort, lot of knowledge, insight gained from reading works of masters, and then getting attitude towards students and effective communication. So think of a lecture that you are going to deliver. This lecture, a good lecture doesn't happen by itself. You must, you have to spend a lot of time to prepare for that lecture. And how do you uh, spend the time? You, you, you may be presenting a very small portion of linear algebra, but the students are smart enough to ask you questions which require advanced knowledge. So a teacher has to know much more than what he's teaching in that subject. So if you may be teaching elementary linear algebra, but you must learn a course on advanced linear algebra in order to answer questions of some smart students in class or you guide them in further reading. And then your textbook may be prescribed by university, you have no control over that, but if you have read the uh, exposition by masters, you can give good insight to your students while lecturing. So a lot of preparation has to go uh, before, before, you start, before you start lecturing. And so spend some time in mastering the material that we are going to present important to read the books uh, written by masters of the subject and write complete notes of every lecture, okay. A lecture cannot be prepared night before, I mean you all know this, okay. 
So the best way to do is to, you have advanced preparation. If you are going to lecture, say, one month from now, you prepare now. You, your preparation should happen a month before uh, any, any lectures that you are going to deliver. It gives you time to prepare. It gives you time to reflect. It gives you time to correct your lecture. Yeah. So you must write. There is a textbook, fine. But you must write the way you are going to lecture. It must be written down, what you are going to say for one hour. Otherwise, it is not going to come out nicely. We don't present mathematics in a class the way it is written in textbook. Never commit this mistake. It should not be presented the way it is written in the book because mathematics is written in reverse way. Okay, they will define things, they will uh, state the theorem and then they do the applications. What I'm trying to impress upon you is you talk about applications first. Present a problem which arose for applica actual application and then, then, then try to develop the mathematics which will solve the problem which arose in actual application. And definition should come at the end. Yeah. So all the material is there in the textbook, but when you are presenting, when you are writing your lecture notes, you have to sort of reverse the presentation that is done. This is true of a proof also. You take a proof in uh, any, any proof in a mathematics textbook. It never motivates how this proof was arrived at. Yeah. But if you closely study and reverse the steps, it becomes clear why the proof, certain proof was written in this way. Okay. So, the, it should not be presented the way it is presented in a usual textbook, but you have to present it with a lot of examples, many applications, and motivate why certain proof is done the way it is done in the book. So that requires a lot of thought and you must write down. Okay. You must write down your lecture. So just, just like actors in a movie, uh, they, they don't talk spontaneously, very rarely. They have a script. They have a written, written down script given by the script writer and they must deliver the dialogues the way it is written down. So a math teacher has to write his own script and then enact it. Uh, of course, with experience, it will become spontaneous. But spontaneity comes only when you have prepared well. Otherwise, it doesn't come. A teacher should not struggle in class to complete a proof or derive an equation, you can't afford to get stuck in derivation or in a calculation. All the calculations have to be done before the class. Yeah, otherwise you will definitely get stuck somewhere and, and that, that is not good. It demotivates the student. If a teacher gets stuck in a calculation, it demotivates the entire class. And therefore, I'm emphasizing that the script of your lecture has to be prepared well in advance. Once you have prepared the script once, you have to con contemplate whether this is the correct script or do you, do you need to revise this? Do you want to present this in a different way? Yeah, so all that preparation has to be done and then only the lecture will come uh, properly. So write complete notes for every lecture at least a week before the class. And good preparation for each class is the key to effective teaching and good preparation lets you answer most of the questions that students are going to ask. Of course, there are always some smart students and some questions that they will have, you will not be able to answer right away because they involve some calculation. You don't know how the calculation is going to come about. So you can, uh, it is, it's a good idea to postpone your answer to the next class, but always come back in the next class and answer that question. Okay. It may require some thought in your office to admit that you don't know the answer to this question, but you will come back to this in the next class. Okay. Yeah. Cor course web page. So you have been told about Moodle. Uh, Moodle is a very, very effective device to create a course web page. Okay. Every, every course should have a web page uh, where you can uh, do uh, wonderful things through Moodle. Of course, there are other, other programs like Blackboard nowadays but I think we, we are using Moodle for all the courses in IIT Bombay. And it's a good, great resource. And it's a free software which you can use for your courses.
so Moodle or Blackboard, uh, the task of maintaining course wave is very easy. Uh, it should be a dynamic and it's extremely effective. Even for small classes, a course web page is very, very useful. Uh, so you can, you can post the syllabus, uh, take, uh, put, put a list of textbooks for, uh, and reference books. You can post your homework assignments, you can post your uh, solutions, and then announce, announce the exams because Moodle is, it, it communicates very well with students. As soon as you post something, immediately the email goes to all the users of that page. Then you, you, can, uh, you can form study groups. There is a way to form study groups in the Moodle page. Okay. So it, it has a list of all the users and you can, uh, the, the teacher can form study groups for the, for the students uh, so that they can uh, discuss among themselves. Yeah. Upload old exam papers and their solutions. Now many students, most of the students, uh, they, they think that what the teacher is putting on the course web page is important. Okay, they have that inherent faith in the teacher that whatever the teacher is putting on the course web page, they must learn. So you put old exam papers and their solutions, they will try those problems. This is a good way of review. Yeah. And some, there are some students who like to do extra reading because they, they can uh, you know, easily uh, cope with whatever syllabus is being prescribed or they have free time. Put some nice articles which introduce, which, which tell what are the historical roots of what you are teaching. And it is not possible to discuss all these things in a class, but you can certainly use the web page to uh, upload this material about the historical roots of your subject. And some sometimes there are nicer presentations or uh, links to videos of the course that you are teaching uh, by some well-known professor somewhere else and uh, you, you can give links to these things. So it is very, very useful to create the resources for the course. Yeah. Distribute course handouts and lecture notes through this. Yeah. So if, you, if, uh, if I think about what is a good lecture, uh, there are many small things that we don't pay attention to. And this is true of large classes. Yeah, large classes where uh, sometimes uh, it can become unruly. A class with 300 students, when all of them have access to their mobiles, yeah, they can start playing games with each other and uh, you are lecturing, but they are playing games. So in these times, the, the teacher has to work extra hard to catch the attention of students. Okay, now it, it is left to you whether you want a policy of no use of mobile in the class. But many things require active use of mobile also. Okay, many, many practices of active learning requires that every student has a smartphone. Okay, for example, uh, many teachers give a small quiz at the end. I think there's a, there's a software that Professor Bhaskar Raman has developed uh, where smartphone is required by every student in the class. At the end of the class, they will see a short quiz on their mobile and they have to, they have to uh, answer uh, multiple choice question. He'll be talking about it. Right, right, right. So, so it is it is a very effective way of catching the attention of students because they know that they had, at the end of one hour, they are going to be tested on what has been taught. Of course, that quiz will be very, very simple. It just requires a little bit of attention in the class. But every in every class, they are tested and it requires that they must have access to the smartphone. Okay. So we have to think about all these new ways of catching attention of students. Uh, so in the, of course, uh, uh, in, in, in a typical lecture, uh, imagine there are 300 uh, people in the audience and uh, the teacher is lecturing through various means, either through blackboard or through slides or uh, some other means. But the main center of attraction is the teacher. It is not the slides. It is not the blackboard. It is the teacher the teacher has to become the main center of attraction. And how the teacher is communicating through his voice. So you cannot afford to mumble to yourself in a large class. You have to really, if you can't speak loudly, uh, use, use microphone like I'm using right now. It is for recording. Uh, but you have to be heard in every nook and corner of the classroom. And that is made possible because you, uh, you through your voice, 
Yeah. So voice modulation is extremely important in a in a lecture. Then we have to capture the attention of class by using our voice properly because you are the most important object in the class. Okay. And you can catch the attention sometime by lowering your voice. If there is a point that you want to emphasize or there is a um, there is a difficult part of the proof, you have to pause. You have to bring silence in the class so that students get time to read, understand what you have said. It is not possible uh, for a good lecturer. Uh, it, it will not be a continuous rendering, rendering of the lectures. They have to be there. You have to think about where to pause in advance. Okay, where to get response from the teachers, from from the audience. Yeah, you can pose small questions even in large class. You can be very interactive and pose small questions and get the response from the students. There are always some smart students who will be able to. Uh, predict the next step in the proof. Okay, I have experienced it many times. However hard the proof is, there is always at least one student in class who can predict what the next step is, but the question has to be framed properly at proper step. Okay, so you can be interactive even while you are presenting difficult material, but you have to pause, you have to ask the right question and prod them to respond. Eye contact. You can't be looking at the blackboard all the time and uh, your, your audience are looking at your back. No. You have to pay attention to individuals sometimes. Sometimes students are asking questions. You must pay attention to that individual. Okay. Sometimes you have to look at the groups of students or sometimes you have to look at the entire class. So your focus has to keep changing during the class so that the students feel that you are being paid attention. I mean, they are being paid attention by the teacher, although the class is very large. But occasionally, you can point to an individual student and uh, it's good to uh, uh, many times know the students by name and uh, you know pronounce their name and ask them that they feel good about that. Yeah. So eye contact, you must look at the audience while delivering your lectures from time to time and not, I'm canvassing use of Blackboard. So on Blackboard, when you're writing, you are, you are not facing the audience. But then, every now and then, as soon as you have filled one blackboard, you leave the, the blackboard, come out and get response from students or uh, revise what you have done. Okay, so it has to uh, be, be, periodically you have to face the audience, even in, in, uh, in a blackboard presentation. Okay, speak to individuals in class, a group of people, uh, or the whole class, yeah, so, uh, now let me go to the blackboard technique. Okay, so I am not canvassing use of slides at all in a mathematics course. Yeah. So if you are using blackboard, you must pay attention to how you organize your lecture on blackboard. Yeah. Many things have to uh, you have to be conscious about how to present your material on the blackboard. So of course, it, uh, when you start, there is always some teacher who filled the blackboard and. Uh, now you have to erase everything. Your equations will get mixed with his equations. Okay, so blackboard has to be neat and clean before you begin your lecture, and nobody else is going to clean. Like in German university, the students clean the blackboard, not the teacher. Yeah, they come and then they clean the blackboard. But we we don't have that tradition, although we respect our teachers greatly. But you must clean the blackboard before your lecture. And large letters in a uh, so typical class, the calculus class is done in this room with about 300 students. And so you can't afford to write small letters. Yeah, it has to be large letters. It may sound very obvious, but it has to be done. Your handwriting has to be in large letters. Otherwise, students at the end will not be able to read. They will stop taking notes. They will lose interest in what you are saying. Yeah, so large letters and in a perfectly horizontal line. Yeah, you have to practice. Okay, when, when I started writing first, uh, when I was a graduate student, I couldn't write in a straight line. Yeah, it is going in different directions. Yeah, so writing on a notebook is very different from writing on blackboard. But with practice, it comes. And you can write neat letters, large letters, in a perfect straight line. And uh, nowadays, students can take picture on their mobile. They don't need to write the notes. Yeah. 
But in order to uh, make sure that they can read what you write on Blackboard, your handwriting should be good. It should, they, every line has to be horizontal. It has to be large letters, yeah. So there are many small things that we want us to wonder. Uh, the diagram should be neatly drawn, and uh, sometimes the diagrams are complicated. Then you can use overhead projector to display the diagram, right? You, you don't have to use Blackboard all the time. Sometimes uh, to, to bring a complicated uh, flow process in chemical engineering, you have to display the entire diagram, and it's not possible to draw on the Blackboard by hand. Okay, so it has to be a combination of some slides and uh, presentation. Yeah, other thing is uh, many teachers will write, but they are simultaneously covering what they write. Yeah, we we don't uh, sometimes we forget. Okay, so therefore when you are writing anything, it has to be visible to your audience, and your hand has to be stressed. It is not you are not writing on a notebook writing on a blackboard, and what you're writing has to be visible all the time. So if you are, say, a right-hander, it's not a good idea to start from left-hand side. If you start from left-hand side and you are right-hander, you will always cover the previous blackboard. We students are trying to, you know, catch up. They are trying to write the notes. They are reading what you have written. But if you are right-hander, you can start from the right-hand note, right-hand blackboard, and then shift to the next one, you will never cover what you are writing on Blackboard. This I learned from one of, one, of, one, of, one of my teachers. I asked him why you are doing this. He said, this is the reason why I am doing this. Yeah. The point is, you, you should not cover what you have written. Otherwise, students will not be able to follow what you have written. It's important that they, they read these equations. Yeah. And do not erase until you have filled all the Blackboards. Yeah. There is no hurry to erase anything. So if you have six blackboards, utilize all of them. Don't erase. Okay. When you are filled up, go to the first blackboard and erase it. No problem. By then, students would have written down everything. Yeah. Then some material needs to be remain on the on the board. Okay. You need to refer to that material, and it's a good idea to put such material in a box so that you don't forget. You uh, you want to erase, you if you erase you have to rewrite all those equations again. So blackboard planning has to be done properly, and during the lecture you have to understand you have to keep in mind what material to keep, what to erase. Yeah. yeah. So these are some of the uh, blackboard techniques. Now what to do during the class? Yeah. So this is how uh, one of my senior professors when I started lecturing on calculus. Uh, told me that first five minutes or ten minutes there will be a commotion in a large class. Students are entering and they are talking and they are waiting for the teacher to begin. So he said, utilize that time. Even if there is a movement in the class, students are settling and they are talking to each other and uh, you know, uh, not possible to uh, cover new material during that time. So utilize the first five minutes to review what you did in last class. So even if some latecomer is there, he's not going to miss the new material. Yeah, but people who are paying attention, they will revise the last class material in first five minutes. Somebody might have missed the last class. If you review what you did in last class, he will be able to follow better. So always begin your lecture with review of what you did in last class. And that should be finished in five minutes. Yeah. Then uh, uh, sometime you can even involve the students. In a small class, I ask the students, you tell me what did I cover in last class? And that really puts them on spot. Okay. Many students will not know what you covered in last class unless they have studied the lecture notes. So it will give a message to them that in order to attend this class, you better read the previous class lecture notes first. So just this small act of asking the students, what I covered in last class will make them read the notes. Some of them will actually read the notes before they come to this class. That itself is, is good enough to understand the lecture that you are delivering. Okay. So this is active way of learning. I'm saying you ask your students 
what you covered in last class, it will get, you will get some responses, but some other unresponsive students will get a message that you must read uh, the lecture notes before you come to class. Yeah. So then you start by giving a brief summary of what you are going to do and pause frequently during a long proof and return to the main points. Yeah, there are always some long proofs, complicated derivations. Uh, you, you don't want to uh, zip through them. You know, go slowly and at the end review the material and ask the students whether there is a difficult portion in the proof that you didn't understand and go back and repeat again and again. Okay. Work out few examples. So there is a, there's a uh, very famous book in abstract algebra written by, uh, by Michael Artin from MIT. And uh, he, he has a good principle. He says, so this is true of uh, a, a mathematical proof. Say, for example, you are proving fundamental theorem of calculus or diagonalization of symmetric matrices. Yeah, it involves many, many steps. But his advice is, before you present a theorem, before you state a theorem, give enough examples, work out small cases. Don't tell what the theorem is. But before you state the theorem, as soon as you state the theorem, the statement should be obvious to the students. It should not come in abruptly. So slowly motivate. If there is a deep theorem, slowly motivate through examples and special cases so that you, the students get convinced about the truth of the theorem before you have even proved the theorem. Yeah, that makes it easy to learn difficult material. Of course, be interactive by asking questions and, uh, and be attentive in listening to the answers. If a student is answering, you must pay 100% attention to what the student is saying. Okay, because he might say some wrong things sometimes. You have to catch if there is a mistake in the response of the student and immediately correct that mistake. Yeah. Of course, we must be confident of ourselves and that confidence comes with a lot of preparation. And of course, this I advise that you must be well dressed in class. Yeah. You can't afford to come in shorts and, uh, and expect that your students will respect you. One has to maintain certain distance. Okay, you, we have to be friendly, but as well as you maintain certain distance from the students. You must be well dressed and speak loudly and communicate, okay, continuously. You are the focus of attention in a class and you have to present yourself properly, yeah. And try to communicate with all the sections and never get stuck in a calculation, okay. This can be very detrimental. The students will lose faith in your ability, yeah. Never get uh, stuck in a calculation. So in order to do that, you have to work out everything before write the script of your lecture. This is the basic principle to follow. You must write your lecture before, before you lecture. Even if it is presented well, even if you have uh, lectured on it before, uh, writing a lecture doesn't take much time. You already know the material. And my experience is that a one hour lecture requires 310 pages, which you can write in half an hour. Okay, but once you have written, I'll assure you that you will never have to refer to those notes in the class. You can just lecture without looking at the notes. Yeah. After the class, many people don't do anything. You must write a summary of what you taught, main points about what you taught. This is like keeping a log book. Yeah. So if you are giving the course for the first time, you have 40 lectures and uh, 40 notes of your 40 lectures. But if you write a summary of what you actually covered, when you present it next time, and you, you have made the planning already. You will know what you possibly can cover in 10th lecture or 11th lecture. And so after, the, after having delivered the lecture, you must write down what you lectured on. And, and it's a summary. And put the summary on the web page. Okay, at the end of, you have 40 summaries of 40 pages, and that's a good resource for the student to revise before the examination. Yeah, spend some time thinking about ways to improve your delivery. You ask yourself, did you answer all the questions that students asked? Was the pace of teaching well suited uh, for the grasping power of an average student? 
Did you write well on the blackboard? Yeah. So after the class, you know, relax and write a summary, and then then only your work is over. Okay. And then you are prepared for the next class. Yeah. This logbook of actual coverage of topics in each lecture will help you to plan your course better when you will teach the course again. Yeah. So weekly assignments, of course, every math course should have a weekly assignment and it should not be too large or too small. And it should give exercises for what you have covered. Okay. But students will not do the assignment. They will not do the assignment unless you adopt certain practices. So I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. Of course, the assignment, I, I suggest that you prepare your assignment using LaTeX. Type your assignment, don't handwrite it. Never give a handwritten examination also, because nobody has perfect handwriting and uh, in mathematics, notation is very, very important. Your notation for certain quantity may be misunderstood. So always type and uh, for mathematics, LaTeX is the best source, best software to, to type. If you don't know, uh, learn a little bit LaTeX. There are YouTube videos on how to LaTeX, yeah. So, yeah, so these weekly assignments, uh, in, a, in a large class with 300 students, I don't have resources to check the weekly assignments, but I must give the weekly assignments. So how do I make sure that the student do the assignment? Well, there's a tutorial. Every week, in every mathematics course in IIT Bombay, there is a tutorial. So I start the tutorial with a short quiz of 10 minutes. And that short quiz asks a student to solve a problem which was assigned in the assignment. It's not a new problem. Yeah, that is very important. It's not a new problem. It is a problem that you expect the student has tried before the tutorial. So that 10 minute quiz is given and that disciplines the entire class. This, this has been uh, my experience that this short 10 minute quiz which is very simple. Okay, uh, doesn't, uh, do, doesn't require much of preparation. If they have heard the lecture and they have tried some problems, they'll be able to solve one problem from the assignment. So you can check that one problem, no problem. But an assignment may have a large number of problems and in a class of 300 students, I don't have time to grade everything. But I do have some assistance and uh, they can grade this quiz. Yeah. So exams and quizzes must have problems from assignments. This is very important. Okay. Much of the exam should be from what they have seen or what they have practiced. Of course, the numbers can change, but they should be similar to what has been on the assignment. Of course, you know, you have to always decide which students, which of your students will, will get an A grade. So there have to be a certain number of difficult problems based on, uh, which are variations on the usual problems, but they are difficult. Okay. You must have some difficult problems in every examination. Yeah. Of course, in, in the tutorial, you can ask the students to work in groups. It is extremely useful. Students learn from each other through discussion and uh, they, they can uh, solve problems faster. So uh, make groups in the tutorial that you conduct. Yeah. So here, are, uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip this uh, tutorial. The, so, so tutorial is, is the place where uh, the active learning takes place. So we are not lecturing in tutorial at all. No new material is covered in tutorial. So there's an, uh, the, there's an assignment given to students and the teacher solves a few problems, but later on the students start solving those problems in groups and the teacher goes around and answers uh, some doubts that the students would have. So this happens in every math class in, in IIT Bombay, that there is a tutorial uh, attached to every math course in which we answer the doubts, we conduct the quiz, we ask students to solve uh, by collaboration, and then they continue. In fact, when they go back to the hostel, the same group sort of continues to solve the problems. They become familiar with each other. So always make groups of students in each one of your course uh, so that they become friends and they start discussing mathematics rather than some movies all the time. Yeah. yeah. So this has uh, office hours, you must have office hours. And uh, there are some shy students who will not ask questions in class, but they do have questions. They do have doubts. And you can deal with those, those students in your office hour. In office hour, you deal with one or two students, not more, so that individual doubts can be answered. 
Yeah. So this is about conducting an exam. How to compose an exam? How to judge the length of an exam? How to grade an exam? Okay, examination, setting examination paper is perhaps the most difficult exercise that a teacher has. Because you, you, the, the, the future of your students is at stake. The kind of exam that you are making, uh, students are going to be judged on their performance, not on what they have learned, but their performance in this examination. So you have to pay a lot of attention to how you compose your examination. Okay, so here are some uh, things that I have learned. Uh, that the traditional exam in which students write complete solution to the question is perhaps the best model, not the uh, multiple choice questions. They are good when you are uh, examining students in lakhs and you know, uh, but in a, in a class, in a typical math class, the questions have to be, uh, should have long answers, the, the multiple choice questions should be discouraged. Okay, but if you have a class of 1100 students, and you don't have assistance to grade so many papers. And my director is telling that within one week you have to declare the exam results. What do you do? You have to adopt a combination of some multiple choice question, some fill in the blanks, but there have to be questions which required, which are traditional questions which require thinking and writing and composing a solution. Yeah, questions could be similar to the ones on the weekly assignments. This is very important. Many questions have to be similar to what is there in the assignment, but some questions have to be difficult because only that will distinguish the A graders from others. Yeah, the question paper should be typed in letter. For mathematics, I'm talking about mathematics question paper. Should be typed in letter. Never write a question paper by hand. It is going to lead to some confusion about some notation. Because you may write uh, gamma in a different way and student will understand in a different way. Yeah. So it should be typed rather than handwritten. Uh, solutions, okay. Once you have prepared your question paper uh, and this is the problem should cover as much syllabus as possible. It's not possible to cover the entire syllabus, but cover the important parts of the syllabus through these questions and spread out your questions. But whether you have, you have made a good question paper, how do I test whether you have made a good question paper? Yeah, so that is tested only when you yourself write the solutions. It's a two hour exam, yeah, set aside one hour where nobody is going to bother you. Yeah, you make your time in such a way that nobody can bother you. You write the solutions yourself and then record the time that you took to answer each question. Okay. You know all the answers, right? You have set the question paper, you have taught the course, you know all the answers. You are going to be faster than the student in writing the answer because you know the answer already. Yeah. The student has to think and then write the solution. But you already know the answer, you will write it fast. Yeah. So record the time that you take to answer a question to write the solution to, to each question, record that time. Student is probably going to take three times more than that. Okay, so a three, three hour exam, if you can solve a three hour exam in one hour, it is probably a good exam. Students will not complain that it's a lengthy exam. Yeah, so record. And then uh, how many marks to assign? All questions are not of similar type. Some are difficult, some, some have lengthy answers. So how to decide how many, question, how many marks for each question? Depends on the time that you spent in writing the solution. Yeah. So uh, say I have a mid sem exam of 30 marks and it's a two hour exam, 120 minutes. Each mark is for four minutes, right? Each mark is for four minutes. So if you took, took eight minutes to write the, if you took, uh, so student takes eight minutes, so you are taking maybe two minutes or three minutes, then you calculate according to the time taken. Yeah, so that's why once you have written, written down your question paper, you have to write, you have to solve the question paper, you have to write the solutions yourself, record the time, and then you will know how many marks to assign to that question paper you will know whether there is a mistake in that question also. Because only when you have written down the solution, you will realize that there is a mistake in the data. 
Yeah? So that is a very, very important exercise to do, that you must write the solution to the exam paper. Yeah. So uh, yeah, marks should be proportional to the expected time taken by the student. Solution and partial credit scheme must be posted on the web page. When you are distributing the answer books, a day before, you post all the solutions with complete marking scheme and you will see that very few students will come for regrading. Yeah, students want to know what was the mistake that they committed. And they will know it only when they see the solution that you have written. And many times I learn from the answers that students write. In, in IIT Bombay, there are many smart students. And they, they come up with very smart solutions. And it's a, it's a learning experience. So, uh, so when I see the solutions, I record some of the good solutions and I, I present them in the partial credit scheme. So each question may have multiple answers. And each, multi, each answer will have its own specific partial credit scheme for the various steps. So all these things have to be recorded in your solution and then post it on the web page a day before you distribute the answer books. Then students will know where they lost the marks. Yeah. So this is the most difficult exercise to set the correct examination paper. And in our courses, we have continuous evaluations. There are quizzes every every week and then there are tests and there are mid -sem and there is a final exam and they constantly we are evaluating the students. So this, this has to be done extremely carefully. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here. There are many things that a teacher has to worry about. Okay, uh, how to write on Blackboard, how to set the question paper, how to prepare, how to write the lecture notes, etc., etc. So a good course. And if, if you follow these, some of these techniques, I'm sure uh, you, will, uh, you will enjoy your teaching and, uh, and, uh, and finish the course with students' satisfaction. Thank you.